Good morning, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that you have agreed to join us on conversations. Uh, you are a very, very popular leader in Delaware, and we are very proud of the fact that you work so hard for making Delaware a better state. Unfortunately, we are having this conversation under extremely difficult circumstances. And so uh, while I want to thank you on behalf uh, of uh, all Delawareans, uh, I also would like uh, to first inquire as to how you personally are coping with the stress of not only the, I mean, you're facing everything that we face, but you are also trying to make important decisions. So how are you coping with that? Well, first of all, Dr. Khan, I want to thank you for the opportunity and thank you for um, always being a, a voice in good times and in bad times. Um, bringing us these conversations is vitally important right now because it will help us um, both from a substance perspective, but also from a human perspective. And even your first question, um, I thank you so much for that uh, about how I'm doing. You know. Um, we, we all use this word unprecedented, that these are unprecedented times. And I, you know, looking back and reaching into my own reservoir of, um, of, 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 or history of my own experiences, it is in the times that are most challenging that I find um, that uh, I have to be most faithful. Um, so, I feel that during this time, I'm probably closer to God than I've ever been. It's sort of like when, when my husband unexpectedly passed away, you know, there's sort of like these moments in your life where only grace can carry you. And um, I feel like right now, so many people are working so hard on the front lines and, you know, whether it is music or nature or, or Zoom family meetings, um, you know, we are all just trying to find the best way to stay strong throughout this pandemic um, and also emerge stronger, better people. So I, um, I'm listening to a lot of gospel music. I'm doing a lot of Zoom videos with friends and family. Um, I sometimes just step outside, look at the sky and just breathe and say, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And um, those, and, and, and I look at the examples of what other people are doing and that motivates me and that inspires me. And so that's how I'm staying well. But thank you for asking. You know, we have been very fortunate uh, that, uh, that the state of Delaware has leaders like you. The governor is working very hard and, and I've spoken with other leaders in the state and I, I, I'm really happy to say that uh, at least we are very fortunate that our leaders are being so responsible and uh, so concerned about their constituency. My first question to you is about, uh, about how do you see the, the state of the pandemic at the moment? Uh, it, we have had two of our worst days in Delaware in the last two days, you know, 12 mm -hmm. and 17, have, uh, 12 and seven have died in the state of Delaware in the last two days alone. And uh, even the nation in the last like seven to eight days, we have been above 1,800 deaths per day, nearly mm -hmm. 2,000 per day. So do you think that we have hit the plateau or things are still going to get worse? Well, you know, one of the reasons why um, the governor um, in his leadership ha has really focused on the science and the data to make decisions and you know, while some other states were starting to talk about opening up their economy, um, he was following the data and still is. And you know, I think you're right when you talk about um, the leadership here in Delaware. We're fortunate that we are a smaller state, and so at multiple levels. Like this morning, I was on the phone with the county executive. Um, in, of Newcastle County. Um, two weeks ago, I was um, going back and forth with um, council people from local governments. Um, the, this last week, I was on the phone with the mayor of Wilmington. And then the congressional delegation itself meets every week with the governor. And so we, as a team, try to approach this 
along with the nonprofit sector, the private sector. I mean, we are fortunate that we have that here in Delaware. Um, but as a country and as a whole, I think one of the challenges is when you don't have the kind of leadership that you can say, I feel confident about that. So for, for example, there are certain things that we can do at the federal level that the state can't do or that a city can't do. You know, they can't um, control or, or help supply chain for equipment that yeah. we need, like PPE, the protective <laughs> gear. And so to me, as a state, um, we are trying to work together, um, but we also have some challenges. I, I, you know me, I, I, I'm blunt, that's my middle name. And <laughs> you know, we, we still have some challenges. I mean, when we are looking at these hotspots in um, Sussex County, when we're looking at hotspots in, in Newcastle County, and, 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 and you know, we realize that we have to have targeted um, interventions that are intentional. And so um, it is something that we've never been through before. And I feel that um, our strength is the fact that so many Delawareans in various sectors know each other and are used to working with each other. And so we can rally together when it's time. You know, I was talking to a, 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 a scholar in a foreign country and I asked him whether uh, he, he and his country was missing America's leadership in this moment of crisis. And he said, if you are going to manage the world the way you're managing your own country, we are happy that you're not leading uh, the response uh, to, to COVID-19 globally. Leave us alone. And, mm -hmm. and to me, that was quite a shock, you know, this perception yeah. worldwide that we are not really responding uh, adequately. And that leads me to talk a little bit about the stimulus package. You know, we have now given away about $2.4 trillion uh, and um, there are lots of uh, unhappiness about how it has been given. People who shouldn't be getting some of the stimulus aid are getting it, and people who should be getting it seem to be lagging behind, especially people uh, of color and minorities and the poor, poorer segments of the society are, are, are less likely to benefit from the stimulus package at the moment. Do, do you feel that, that that perception is valid? Well, you know, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge um, and um, the folks that have been struggling, uh, our small businesses throughout our state that, you know, there are so many small businesses that are the backbone of, of who we are. They provide jobs, they provide services, they, you know, they keep us running. And so there are a lot of businesses who have received funding to be able to stay afloat. I think the intention behind the um, Paycheck Protection Program, as well as um, the idle loans and grants for um, disasters and emergencies um, are positive things. Uh, the challenge is, number one, um, equity and also accountability. Those are challenges, um, especially when you're talking about this amount of money in programs that have never been set up before. I mean, even just hearing our SBA talk about the fact that the number of loans that they took in in like two weeks is more than they've done in maybe two or two or 10 years. I mean, yeah. the scale of this is so massive. And so that's why it's incumbent upon us as, as legislators, as you know, whether it's our state legislature or us in Congress to make sure that there are accountability measures put in. And I think that is what people deserve. That's what they want. They don't want you to just say, here's some money. And then there are no, there's no way to, to account for where did those dollars go? Did they go to the places that they needed to go? And I think one of the things that we did in this emergency interim package was take into account what we were hearing on the ground, that within those two weeks, it was a first come first serve process. So anybody who already had an accountant, already had a banking relationship, they were easier to get those, um, those, those loans. And we said, no, there are folks that are unbanked or underbanked, and they're not getting their, their entree in, or opportunity to get this funding. And so there was a specific carve out especially for credit unions to be able to do the lending, um, community development financial institutions, CDFIs, um, these minority serving uh, institutions, these groups that could help 
veterans, women, the smallest of the small businesses. And, and so as we get that information, we're making sure that we funnel it into the, the changes and the updates that we make to this, this, this legislation. But also we are making sure that we have accountability because that, that's, that's important. As you said, there, there are some stories that, that are, are, are crazy about companies that got money that didn't really need it and gave it back yeah. and, and need to give it back. Yeah. So you're right. Um, there are those stories. But when you think of the magnitude of what we're dealing with, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that folks across the spectrum um, get the resources that they need. And that's individuals as well. Um, individuals are hurting. The, we've seen unemployment numbers that like we've never seen in our life, you know. So um, this, this is a moment where we're going to have to get the resources out to people that need it and need it now. Well, one of the fears uh, is that while coronavirus uh, may not uh, kill a lot of people, even though we have already crossed 65,000 in the United mm -hmm. States, uh, the way it's going to cause its maximum damage is through the economic fallout, and particularly mm -hmm. through unemployment and reduction in the size of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people keep using the word depression levels uh, in mm -hmm. terms of unemployment. but. I think this is also the first major economic crisis where the government has responded this quickly. You know, we have, I, I don't think we have had uh, yeah. stimulus packages in within weeks uh, of the crisis right. beginning, right? Right. So right. we are addressing it as the crisis unfolds. Right. And I think that is the best part. And a lot of commentators are missing the point that in right. the past, we have uh, uh, waited to see what the crisis ultimately mm -hmm. leads to and then try to address. And now right. we are trying to preempt. And I think part of it is also helping. Uh, but ultimately, we really don't know whether we're going to come out of this by July or whether it will go right. into October, November. Uh, and uh, so if the third quarter is also affected, uh, then we are going to be in serious trouble. So th the question is, how, how much money can uh, the, feds, the federal government really mm -hmm. keep packing? And already we have exceeded 10% of the GDP, right? Yeah. I mean, I think... Th First of all, to your first point, um, this the the amount of money that um, and the timing. I mean, literally, two point five trillion dollars, like in the in in the beginning of this. That's how much we debate and discuss for a year's budget, like a conversation yeah. for appropriations. And so, to be able to do that and to respond in a bipartisan way, every bill that we have passed has been bipartisan, is really important. You know. I think for many of us, like, you know, folks know, I, I, I had not run before until 2016. And, um, you know, coming in, one of the concerns that, you know, I had, having been in state government, was that you do care about this budget. You do care about the debt. We understand that when you have deficits like this, it we, you pay for it down the line. Yeah. It, it, it's either going to be your, your, your kids or your nieces or somebody's going to pay for that. And even in the very beginning, you know, that was one of the challenges that we had. But I think when we look at this situation, even Republicans, Democrats across the board are saying, we have to do whatever we need to do for our country to not just survive this, but to thrive out of it. And so um, we still are concerned about our deficits. We still are concerned about the debt. Um, but this is a, a, a moving target. You know, it's, it's interesting because even the guidance that we get, as we've seen over these past, just, just the past six weeks, has changed. Yeah. You know, we do not yet know fully what kind of toll it will take on us or even the, the specific science around it. I mean, that alone, like how long does it last on a surface, you know, the, the masks, in the beginning, people were saying, don't, you don't need to wear a mask. Or you can wear a mask if you're taking care of somebody who's sick or, yeah. or vulnerable because you don't. And now we're saying, if you're in a public space, we went from, I think it was like 100 people in a room to 50 people in a room to 10 people in a room. Yeah, right. There's so much that we're still learning. And so we have to do whatever we can do and it's all hands on deck. And I think that's why you're seeing 
the bipartisan support for the, these bills is because we need to do whatever we need to do. You know, one of the differences between um, the state and federal government, and um, people put it a bit more crassly by saying that the, the federal government can print money, uh, whereas the states cannot. But really, many of the states are constrained by their constitution That's for right. having balanced, uh, budget. Ba balanced budget issues. Like right. our, our state is balanced budget, and I, yes. and I think we have already burned through the surplus that we had for about 160 million last year. So what's going to happen to, to the states? Uh, how are they going to address the challenges uh, because they can't uh, you know, indulge in deficit spending? And so far, the stimulus has uh, addressed uh, private citizens, businesses, but not really helped our states and cities. Yeah, well, we have put money in for, for, st for states and local governments, but in this last emergency relief package, we also had the same concerns that you do about the fact that, you know, the states are, the, that, that, that's where, that's the battleground. That's where, where we are seeing and feeling um, the, the activity. And the reality is um, one of the reasons why our caucus was fighting so hard to get money in this last emergency package for state and local governments was because we know three things are going to happen if, if, you, if you do not, uh, if they don't have the resources. It might require t raising taxes. It might require laying people off and ultimately cutting services. And so that has an impact on everybody. It's not just like, oh, we're just giving some money to the state and local government. No, that they're the ones on the front lines providing services to folks and they need to have the resources to do that. What good is having, we, we send money for testing, but you don't have public health officials you know so so it is all connected and um you will continue to see us advocate for that one of the other challenges for states and local governments is getting the guidance to know how they can use the money and then be able to have the flexibility to 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 use the money as well so that's some of the conversations we're having with the governor um with uh local officials with legislators uh, state legislators here is how can we make sure that um that they have the resources they need and that they have the ability to deploy them in, in the ways that best work for the local and state um, operations. You know, one of the ironies of the situation is that the sector, one of the sectors which has been hit the most is the medical sector. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, the revenues that are coming in for hospitals, et cetera, have dwindled significantly. In fact, in some states, I think in Minnesota, the salaries of doctors and others has been cut by 20%. Mm -hmm. And I find that horrendous that these are the people who are right in the front lines of the battle against coronavirus. And, and because of the inability of the states to, to, to you know, get aid, they, are, they have to cut uh, finances. But I also want to touch upon this uh, issue that the, that the virus and uh, it's not uh, it's not democratic in the sense that people of color, people who are poorer, are facing uh, far more difficulties in in fighting this. For example, if you look at Louisiana, at some point, seventy percent of all dead were African Americans. Right. In the state of Illinois, the, some states yeah. it is jumping up that uh, how disproportionately certain communities. Uh, are getting uh, affected, and they're not getting affected for biological reasons. They're getting right. affected because of inequity in the in the in the in the society. So, is there any way in which future stimulus packages uh, will try to address this issue? Well, I'm actually uh, a member of a smaller working group of, from the Congressional Black Caucus that is looking specifically at that. Um, we know that health disparities have existed. And those disparities have existed for multiple reasons. Um, so some socioeconomic, but some not. Some because of implicit bias or, or structural raci racism. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that um, many of our essential workers are, are put in um, harm's way and they may be people of color just because that's the job that they have. Um, when you look at the issue of where people live, you know, if I live in a place that's close to um, a toxic area, and then I might develop asthma, 
Um, so some of those underlying conditions that we talk about that are contributing factors to COVID-19 are things that are what we call the social determinants of health. You know, those social things. If I live in a place where there is a food desert and there are no supermarkets or, or, or where the things that I can buy to eat are not healthy, that contributes maybe to diabetes. Um, so you have the issue of underlying health issues, you have the issue of jobs, um, and, and then just access to care and people believing you when you come in um, to a doctor's office for, 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 for treatment. And so, so you have all these competing issues. And as the, one of the things that the CDC is looking at is number one, testing those areas that we know are, are, are potentially hot spots where they are, and, and that's some of what is happening right here in Delaware, um, you know, where we have folks in Sussex County, as you were just mentioning before, where we know because of working conditions, because of housing conditions, um, there we've seen a spike in the number of cases. So we're looking at testing. Um, we're looking at making sure that both testing and treatment, I have a bill for everybody that treatment, if you contract COVID-19, treatment shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be prevented from getting it because you don't have out of pay, out of pocket cash to pay for that treatment. Um, so that's one of the bills that I have to say insurance companies should cover that. Um, so it's testing, it's treatment, it's also access. Um, one of the things that we are advocating for are mobile units to be able to go to places where testing needs to be done. And then there are issues of, of isolation to make sure that that individual has a place to be where they can't infect you know, others in their family. And then if you're doing that, well, how am I gonna get paid for work? The last piece of that is um, to make sure that there is some kind of economic opportunity, whether it's like, like jury duty, um, you get some kind of pay or stipend to help you. Um, it's a comprehensive question, but I think it goes to bigger issues that we had before COVID-19. And I think that what COVID-19 presents is an opportunity to shine a magnifying glass on things that already existed. Um, it also, I mean, take for example, the fact that because of this, we're doing this through Zoom. People are having their meetings that way. Um, people are doing telehealth, um, you know, telemedicine. Kids are being schooled this way. But if you don't have access to broadband internet, or a, or a, 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 a laptop or, a, a, or, or even a phone that has good service, you can't, you, you, you are gonna be disproportionately impacted. Yes. And so to me, again, what this presents is an opportunity to say, this is how things have been, but based on what we're seeing, where do we need to go? And as you know, one of the areas that I have been passionate about is the future of work. And the fact that people in our country, we're dealing with automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, where jobs are being shifted. And that impacts people's ability to, to actually um, live their purpose, but also to survive and to have an economic well-being as well as uh, uh, be healthy. And so to me, this helps us look more broadly at do we really have broadband access for everybody in our state? Are there pockets in Sussex or Kent or, or the city of Wilmington where people can't get access? If you can't get, get it, you don't have it. This is the same with healthcare. If you can't afford it, you don't have it. And so to me, what has happened is that this has shown a light on things that we knew were there, um, but it's forcing us to deal with them. I mean, we have come into this with pre-existing conditions. You know, we have a health crisis going. We had the opioid crisis. That's right. We have uh, the discrimination issues that we were talking about it. And, and also this perennial question that, uh, that the current health system that we had was not serving the country very well. And I'm sure there will be reckoning after the coronavirus crisis is gone. We really don't want to miss this opportunity. If you right. notice how Canada was able to... Uh, to quickly ban uh, their assault weapons after one crisis, but we are not able to to fix our problems, even though the problems keep uh, emerging. 
uh, repeatedly. So I think that once we get out of the coronavirus crisis, I hope the leadership in this country really looks hard at the image that we saw in the mirror, mm -hmm. really, and addresses this issue. I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, this this issue of um, the rise of uh, ethno nationalism in, in in the U.S. Uh, white nationalism. If you see the protest images uh, that we see uh, at Michigan's in the state of Michigan, yes. yeah. I mean the people are laying siege uh, to the Capitol there, and uh, the images are are very scary in terms of uh, uh, as to how it looks as if that this is an asylum where where the inmates are, are, are just running right, you know, mm -hmm. they're going completely crazy. And the episode that you recently had mm -hmm. of racial Zoom bombing, mm -hmm. I mean, all of these things are also exaggerating the situation, don't you think so? Right. You know, it, again, it's, it's back to the same thing when we were just having the conversation about um, the disparities. It's shining a light on what exists. But it's, it's interesting because even when the um, Zoom bombing happened to me, I thought about the fact that while I'm seeing something on my screen, what I also saw on my screen were like uh, maybe almost a hundred other people who were just trying to do good, who, 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 who to me typify more who we are. And I, the other day, I, I was looking at the news and I saw the images in Michigan as well. And initially, you know, it's, it's just horrific. I mean, the, 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 the messages, the symbolism. And, but then I, I, I looked and I said, that looks like a lot of people. But for some reason, somebody actually on the Zoom bombing had as their background, the image of the um, inauguration of Barack Obama and how many thousands and yeah. if I don't know if it was a million people, I don't even know how many people it was, but it were so many people. Um, and I thought about the March on Washington and I thought, I just, I thought about the fact that, like I said on that thing, hate will not bring us down, you know, and the only way that that's possible is if we individually, individually think about what can I do to show love? That's the other thing that this, this crisis is magnifying, is people who are going to jobs who, I had a person deliver groceries to me and she broke down in tears because she was afraid, you know, and I was like, I'm gonna tip this woman. Like I never tipped anybody before because just delivering groceries, you know, is an act of love. The people who are working in nursing homes, you know, who are taking care of our family members, the companies that were talking to me the other day, how they shifted what they've done. Like here in Delaware, the, a distillery that stopped making gin and vodka and started making hand sanitizer. Just like it's magnifying those things, it's also magnifying the heart and soul of who we are. And I will tell you, you know, when that moment happened, I, I told my team, I said, in, in, instead of fear, I just, I just felt like, I just felt like God's love just jump in and say, we got this. Everybody's good, you know. And 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 then too, I'm I'm a mom, so like the mama bear instinct kicked in as well. But um, but I I that gives me hope. That gives me hope, and that's why what you're doing. It's important. It's important, Doctor Khan. It is important, and we appreciate you. So I want you to know that. I know I actually have to go because I've got I calls. I know it's Saturday, but I'm still, we're still working. Um, but I just want to thank you. I want to thank your students because that's, that's, that's where, 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 where it begins. It is educating us. It is 
making us connect the dots to who we are and our connectivity to each other in this world. And it is, it is realizing that whether we like it or not, we're in it together. Like, was it King who said we may have come over on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's it. We're in the same boat now, whether you like it or not. So let's love each other instead of hate each other. Yes. I mean, this moment is not only showing the, the warts, but it's also showing the, the, the love and the courage. Um, and the resilience, that they, yes, and the Strength. resilience, yeah, and, yes. and the ability to bear uh, stress and hardship is, is also, and yet in that in those moments of hardship, people are willing to sacrifice and give, yes. and that is, uh, I think that is ultimately the best of human spirit is also showing. So, That's Congresswoman, thank you very much for talking thank to you. me. Thank you. And, and I pray that you stay strong. Uh, and uh, and I'm sure my students and, and whoever watches this will take both courage and inspiration from you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care. Bye.